All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am ready to go. If you're ready to listen, well, whether you're ready to listen or not, I'm going to start talking. That's just what's going to happen. So welcome to a brand new episode of Student of the Gun Radio brought to you by me and our various sponsors and so on and so forth. What are we going to talk about today? Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Ammo Wars. Yes, we're going to talk about ammo. I was inspired. Uh, my good buddy, my good buddy, Marty left hand over at taking lead. I mean, talking lead. Uh, he invited me on to the latest episode of his AK corner episode or show. They have, a, they have actually a main show and then they have a, a, uh, a side show, a side show. It's a side show. Yeah. It's, I was there though. It must've been a side show, uh, sure. called the AK corner that they do once per month. And I was a guest on the AK Corner, and I was talking with um, Marco Vor, Vorbie, Voro, Vorobiev, Vorobiev, and and Joe. Is that Mo. the guy that brought the 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 bacon vodka? Yep. Yeah, you were okay. just going to say the guy who brought the bacon vodka. Yes. The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, Him and I can be friends. There you go. And uh, Joe Mo and Marty and I. I was inspired by our conversation. So we're going to talk about Ammo Wars today, and we're going to talk about uh, what else? Oh, uh, student of the gun homeroom, are you ready to defend your children? And if you're not, who is? And then we've got a see, I told you so. We've got a see, I told you so. For those of you who doubt me, you should never do that. And all of that is coming up right after Zach hits the magic button that does the cool music. Welcome to Student of the Gun Radio, planting freedom seeds since 2013. Here we don't just talk about guns and gear, we also discuss current events and politics. Because guns are politics. Now, sit back, relax, and allow today's episode to drip ever so gently into your ear. Please welcome your co-hosts, founder of Mastermind Media and Consulting Group, Jared Martin, and the shipping ogre, Zach Martin. Now, give it up for your beloved host, the Pimp Hand of America, Professor Paul Markle. Yes, indeed, it is I. And uh, this last weekend, we had Father's Day. Hope you guys called your dads, uh, talked to your dads, acknowledge your fathers this uh, last weekend. Fathers are important. And Zach came over, didn't you, Zach? Yes, indeed, I did. Zach made the journey over into the valley and helped me uh, tremendously. Somebody asked me on Monday, they're like, how was your, uh, how was your father's day? Was it relaxing? I was like, actually, <laughs> kind of, but we did a lot of work, didn't we, Zach? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got a bunch like, of stuff done. Like Rihanna said, work, 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 work. Is that what she says? Oh, okay. I think it was her. I thought she said, ow, stop hitting me. <laughs> so we... we You're uh, so insensitive. Yeah, so... What Zach helped me to do, which you guys may or may not know, well, you probably don't know, but what we're doing is we're creating uh, what is going to essentially be a Team Room West. Uh, you guys know where Team Room East is, obviously. Uh, if you don't know where Team Room East is, you need to hip yourself and, and pay a little bit better attention to what's going on in the world. Uh, or go back and listen to the two previous episodes. We could do that. <laughs> but we're setting up, uh, and behind me, what you, you see, we're setting up what is essentially going to be a Team Room West uh, or a Warrior's Lodge or a uh, Pipe Hitter's Hangout or whatever you want to call it. What we're doing is... I like is we're, that one. Yeah, Pipe Hitter's Hangout. What we're doing is we're creating a space where people can stay for our... Western training. Uh, we're creating essentially a team room, a warrior's lodge, a pipe. And, and so what Zach helped me do, uh, if you guys have never uh, or looked up bunk beds if you, lately, if you try and get bunk beds, you're like, yeah, like I had in my, you know, my kids had in their room 25 years ago, little bunk beds. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. If you go online, we discovered, I discovered this actually a while ago. But if you go online and look up bunk beds and you come up with good deals, there's a reason they're good deals because the weight limit is like 125 or 150 pounds per, <laughs> which is cool. 
But I'm going to go ahead. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Here's me out on a limb uh, and say most of our students and people who come to our classes will weigh more than a buck fifty. So that does that doesn't really work for us. So what we had to do is we had to search for adult bunk beds for full size. And so what we we've got and what Zach helped me do is uh, Zach was instrumental in helping me uh, assemble. Actually, the last two times Zach's been here, we've done, we've built bunk beds. So we have now not one, but two sets of adult bunk beds with full size mattresses on them. I mean, if, if, here's the, the truth is the truth is if, uh, it was, you know, if it was just a twin or a single, it doesn't matter because one person's going to sleep in it. The, the issue is the weight limit. Is it is if you most ninety percent of the bunk beds that you find online are rated for kids, right? Yeah. Uh, you, you, for if you want to do the smaller ones that fit adults, you have to build completely custom, which is fine and everything. Well, but actually, you know who has the perfect ones? The military. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Military oh, I bunk if beds some surplus. That would be well. The mattresses probably suck. Yeah, well, the military bunk beds are heavy, but they're also rhinoceros tough. Yeah. And I looked, I looked for them. I couldn't find any. Uh, what you can go to that? What, what's that? Uh, Gov Planet. Yeah, and then like pay for shipping or have oh, to geez. send it. There's send nothing a, close. Send so. a truck to Montana. Yeah. <laughs> well, Montana's <laughs> relatively close. We just load up the trailer and, and relatively close for the West. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's only 14 hour drive in Texas it's, miles. It's, like, it's relatively close. It's right there. <laughs> anyway. So, um, so Zach helped me out. Zach was, uh, tremendously helpful, uh, this weekend. Uh, la the last two times Zach's come up to visit, I put him to work assembling bunk beds. And uh, when we announce, which we will be doing soon, won't we, Zach and Jared? When yes. we announce the opening for the foreign weapons familiarization class, one of the options is going to be, would you like to stay at our lodge? Would you like to stay at our pipe hitters hangout, our warrior lodge, our team room west? That will be an option. So look for that in the very near future. All right. So uh, I think I've... I've vamped long enough. Jared, do you have the uh, the uh, review of the week? And while you're looking up the review of the week, I will remind you guys that if you're listening live on Discord, which you can and should be doing, uh, you can ask questions, and we will pay attention to those, or at least the boys will pay attention. I do not pay attention to the Discord while I'm recording, but uh, it's there. And if you're listening at this moment in time, and you're saying to yourself, what is this Discord thing? And how can I get involved? Well, I'll tell you. You can go to studentofthegun.com slash Discord or the official Student of the Gun channel on Discord. And you can follow the, what does it say, live? SOTG live? Yeah, I think that's the SOTG, what, yeah, SOTG live. live public. SOTG live. That's what we are right now. We're, we're live and we're in the video and you can see my little face and everything. Your little uh, face. So, uh, so yeah, and, and we, 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 Jared, we, you know, the, 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 what, what do you want to call the public area or the great area in the basement, uh, on, on floor, on the first floor over by the fireplace. Yes. Zach helped me clean that whole thing out. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah, so we got all that. We got all the garbage out and, and, uh, it, it looks, it looks very presentable now. It wasn't like we had garbage, like, like there was just old potato chips things. There was, yeah. there was still some construction material. Peanuts there was like, and there rats. Was like, and there was flooring. There was floor, like flooring pieces and carpet remnants and stuff like that. So we got rid of all that crap. All right. What is the uh, review of the week, Jared? Did we play the opening? Yeah. yeah and did, did you check ago. the notes? Oh, yeah. yeah we, played, we played the opening. Okay. We uh, sure did. Uh, Perfect. Uh, this thing, is that we, what Jared's referring to? We could do it again if you want. Notes. That's having too much fun playing with this toy. <laughs> oh, you're so silly.
Let's jump directly into, there's a lesson here that says stress recovery adaptation is a lesson for all of us. Yes. Not just the gym. Yes. So I had an epiphany and an epiphanous moment. I've been taking my, my mushroom pills, not those kind of mushrooms, the other ones. Uh, <laughs> but um, in the, I had a, uh, a, a hard leg day yesterday. Yesterday was my heavy squat day. So since I'm in the advanced intermediate or intermediate advanced or whatever it is, uh, I guess it's advanced intermediate uh, program. I don't, I'm no longer in uh, linear progression, which means I, I don't, every time I squat, I don't lift more weight because I, I max and now, now it's a balancing act. So I'm, and I, one day a week is the heavy one. Then there's another one that's a volume one. Then there's another one that is a, a friggin' pause squat, which is my favorite thing. I love those. Those do. are great. Um, so I was feeling it in the legs. Woke up this morning feeling a little bit achy, a little bit tired in the legs. And there's a reason for that because I stressed them. And then... Now I, I'm in the recovery stage, and in a couple of days I will be I will have adapted. But ladies and gentlemen, stress recovery adaptation, uh, which we learned, which is the mantra of Barbell Logic, uh, Barbell Logic online coaching. If you have not availed yourself to studentofthegun.com/bloc Barbell Logic, you really should. Uh, Stress recovery adaptation is a lesson for life, not just the gym. Now, just as with the gym, if you stress yourself, you will grow muscle. That's how muscles grow, right? You stress the muscle, and then it, re it recovers, it repairs, and after it's done repairing, when it repairs, it comes back a little bit more than it was before. That's how muscles get big. I know you're like, what? Yeah, that's how muscles get big. Muscles get larger because you stress them and then they repair or recover. And the part of that reparation or that repairing or that recovering is there's a little bit more, right? It's the same in life, but you have to be able to recover. You see, one of the things that we learn in Barbell Logic Online Coaching is the importance of recovery. How do you recover? Well, you have to give your body the proper nutrition. You have to feed your body protein because muscles build with protein. Muscles don't build with Lucky Charms uh, or Mountain Dew freaking blueberry Bahama Blasts or whatever. You have to give your body nutrition. And one of the biggest things that I learned when, way back when I, when I was listening to Mark Ripito's, um, Mark Ripito's podcast, and people would write in questions, and they're like, I'm a, I'm a vegetarian. How can I get the proper nutrition to, to recover? And, and he said, you can't. You have an eating disorder. And until you fix your eating disorder, I can't help you. And I love that because... People will try, they'll, they'll stress, and they'll try to recover. They won't recover because they're not doing it right. You've got to give yourself the nutrition and also sleep, and then there's also supplements. But nutrition, nutrition and sleep, and then supplements are down here. So nutrition and sleep are about what? What did Matt say? Like 95% of the equation yeah. of recovery? You can definitely tell if you don't get enough sleep or yeah. enough nutrition to help yourself recover you definitely feel how how long yep. it takes so nutrition sleep and then the final five percent is supplements well when it comes to your personal life and growth in your personal life you're going to have stress everyone's going to have stress uh, you, you, it's you can't get around it but if you adapt or if you're going to adapt, if you're going to come back from the stress better than you were, because that's the whole point of going to the gym and lifting up the heavy weights and lifting the steel is you're stressing. And then you're going to your, your goal is the adaptation, right? The gains. 
but you can't get to the games or the adaptation if you don't do the recovery correctly. And I believe this is where a lot of people miss the boat uh, in life. They have the stress, but they don't do the recovery. They're unable to do the recovery. And you know what I just realized here, or I just created? I created an entire show in this time. <laughs> <laughs> I just created an entire show with this topic. So um, I want you to think about that. Remember we talked about humping makes you hard? Yep. Why, why does the military force do force marches, ruck marches, humps? Why do they do that? I mean, they've got trucks. They have helicopters. You know, they have ships and, and, and planes and stuff. Why do they make you do that? You know, when you're 18 years old and you're on a ruck march or a hump, you, you, it's easy to say to yourself, this is stupid. We have trucks. <laughs> We're not going to walk into combat. Why are we doing this? They're not doing that so you can practice walking into combat. They're doing that so that you can grow, that, you're, that you can grow mentally. Physically, yes, but mentally, it, it, the hump... The ruck march is high stress. But once you've accomplished it, once you've done it, once you've pushed yourself beyond the limits that you thought were possible, you realize that there's more inside of you than you, than you knew, than you understood. You didn't know. Before you complete a, a hump or a ruck march or a force march or whatever you want to do, before you do that, you have no idea what's inside of you, what you can reach down and get, the courage, the mental courage and fortitude that you can muster. You don't know because you've never done it. You see, that's the thing is most Americans, most humans never realize their full potential because in order to realize your full potential, you have to engage in what? That sucks. Stress, you've yep. got to embrace the suck. If you want the adaptation, you've got to embrace the suck. You've got to violent, you've got to engage in. I know, you know, uh, what did Scott say? He goes, it's, it's a uh, uh, good rhetoric. 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 Good. Thank you very much, Zach, for filling that in. Good rhetoric. Zach does But listen. it's true. But it's absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, vol engage in voluntary hardship. And what we see in our modern world is rather than engaging in voluntary hardship, we see people running the other, the other direction. We see people hiding, running from hardship, from voluntary hardship. I don't want to do that. It's too hard. Look at, look at the, uh, just, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Uh, look at training. Look, you know, physical, actual training. Where you, where you get in your car or you buy a plane ticket or whatever, you go somewhere to engage in training. Every American who owns a gun should engage in training because it's the right damn thing to do. But how many do that? 2%? Five would be large. We, we might be able to get away with five because of concealed carry permit classes. But the, the amount of people that own guns versus the amount of people that engage in legitimate, genuine training with them is, is infinitesimal. Because why? Because you have to engage in voluntary hardship. Yeah. Because you might, you might go there and find out that you're not as good as you think you are. You're not as good as you tell your buddies that you are. And that you don't, you, they can't ha your ego can't handle that. Their ego can't handle that. So instead, they run away with, from it. Or they make excuses. I don't need that. I've been shooting my whole life. I know what I'm doing. How hard can it possibly be? My dad taught me how to shoot. Therefore, I don't need your class. All of these things are shying away from the stress. So there will never be recovery and there will never be adaptation and you will never improve. There you go. All right, Duracoat, finish fire wait, moment of the world. Wait, I, I have a little bit to add to this, and I don't remember if I talked to you about this or not, so I'm mostly talking to you right now, and 
everybody else can just listen. But the the book that I'm reading from Michael Bain, it's uh, it's called Over the Edge. Uh, something the subtitle something like a regular dude's quest or odyssey in extreme sports. And the, what he's trying to do and the reason he took up, he, he calls this thing that he made the list, right? The list of these 13 activities that he's going to go do that to help him find this, uh, what he calls flow. And I think I'd spoken about this on the grad program, but um, Sikh Sant Mahali is the one that called it flow. And what it is, is this harmony between the mind and the body. And, um, so he, Michael set out to find how to do this. And the best way he could find is to do extreme sports. And the reason I believe is because it's, it's very difficult on your body and it really tests your physical limits, but it also tests your mental limits. And that's just reiterating exactly what dad just said. It's like to, to get the most, to, to reach your maximum potential as a human you have to put yourself through the stress recovery adaptation process. And so I thought it was interesting because my epiphany on this was I'm reading Michael's book that was written in like 1997. And I sent him a text. I was like, Hey man, did you like learn anything else since you wrote the book about this mysterious thing that happens with the human body? And, uh, and he said that the, the only thing that he's learned outside of what he wrote in the book was that the older you get, the harder it gets to achieve that level. And which I was thought was interesting because Mm -hmm. I thought that the older you get, the easier it would be to challenge your, your body. And maybe the mind is the problem. If you want to call it that there, because the older you get, the more sound of a mind you, you have, I guess, until a certain level. But um, if you've done life right, the older you get, the more wise and the more mentally strong you should be. And physically strong too. You know, we have this barbell training program nowadays, so you don't have to get weak as you get old. You can actually be the strongest you've ever been in your entire life. That's a whole separate discussion. You can. Yeah, that's right. Somebody on this call is that way right now. Actually, multiple people are, but I don't have the, I don't have the, the, um, the grandpa status to make it impressive. You know, it's this should just be normal for people in their (laughs) thirties. Right. So yeah, the exactly. penny that I had was the thing that Michael is writing about. And even though he's talking about extreme sports, I think it's the same thing that uh, Musashi was talking about in the book of five rings when he said something to the effect of the spirit of the thing will reveal itself. Yep. And I don't remember the whole quote, but what he's talking about is the spirit of the thing revealing itself to the dedicated student. You got to do it. Yeah, to be a dedicated student in the martial craft, you have to challenge yourself mentally and physically. And so so between uh, Musashi's The Spirit of the Thing, Sikh Sant Mahali's Flow, and Michael Bain's book talking about this the same thing, it's like we're still, <laughs> Musashi was like centuries ago, right? Oh, yeah. And, and we're now we're centuries later and we still don't like really yeah. understand what that is. Now we know better, a little bit better how to achieve it, but we don't know what it is. So, uh, and then another epiphany I had was, Oh, well in today's day and age with the advent of extreme sports. And I think the, the term extreme is probably overused a little bit, Extreme, yeah, but, um, the, with the advent of that, you no longer have to use a martial lifestyle or, um, go to combat or whatever that looks like to further yourself in understanding this, this mind body connection that exists on the edge of your limits. Um, I I think that every, every man, every able-bodied male should have the ability to um, be, to, to exhibit, uh, what am I looking for here? To exhibit strength and power but also the control to not, if they don't have to, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and, and that obviously that entails being skilled in, in some sort of martial way. I think that men are meant to be like that. And so I'm not saying don't do that. Don't train for the martial way, which is, you know, you're here at student of the gun. So I'm sure you understand that, but there are other ways 
to do that as well to to achieve this mind body connection that that uh seeks in mahali and, and michael bain call flow there you go and we're 25 oh. minutes in yeah sorry so uh let's go ahead and go to the Duraco finish firearm of the week segment stuff in the All right, so I was on the Talking Lead podcast, uh, the AK Corner, and one of the things that I displayed on the AK Corner was a uh, a washer ten underfolder with the Rhodesian brush stroke camouflage on it, the baby poop, and something that you may have, and this leads me to I have other, I've got lots of baby poop stuff, uh, I have lots of Rhodesian camouflage guns. And one of the ones that I have is a is the ARMED, the Armalite Rifle Minimum Effective Dose. And if you did, and the reason I brought this up is because someone sent me a message yesterday, and they said, "Hey man, who did the camouflage on the gun that you used in the recent video called Saving Aunt Susie?" Uh, so. Zach, if you want to drop that hyperlink in there, you can, you can do that. Uh, there's two hyperlinks in the show notes. There's one to uh, my uh, the latest episode of the AK Corner that I'm on. So that's kind of a bonus. If you can't get enough, jump on over and uh, follow the hyperlink, and you can listen to the latest AK Corner. But uh, in the uh, the video that Zach shot, did you shot that the last time you were here, didn't you, Zach? Yeah, not 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 this last time, but the time before that. Not yesterday, but yeah, you know, like like a couple weeks ago. It was a Memorial Day weekend. This when you say yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I didn't know that was a question. That was a statement. Yes. Yeah, it was a Memorial Day weekend. So Zach came over on Memorial Day and we shot a bunch of videos and he's he's producing a bunch of videos. And one of them was called Saving Aunt Susie. And it was a discussion of a rollout bag or a turnout bag or a go bag or a shoulder bag or whatever you want to call it. And what you would put in there, and why you would put it in there, and uh, the the rifle last last year, last summer, we did the ARMED project, and we went to the Brownells catalog, and uh, we got a whole bunch of pieces and parts. So we got the KE Arms complete lower, and a barrel barrel, and and the DPMS upper receiver, and all of that stuff. We put it all together, and we made the ARMED. Armalite rifle, minimum effective dose. It is a lightweight gun, but it does everything it needs to do. Um, it doesn't have anything extra on it that it doesn't need to have. And the last part of the puzzle, for at least for me, was to put a camouflage finish on it. And so what I did is I went to the Duracoat catalog. Yes, I went to the Duracoat catalog, and I got as close as I could to baby poop yellow, the Rhodesian baby poop yellow. Now, Duracoat doesn't have a color called Rhodesian baby poop yellow. <laughs> but they do have a Russian Special Forces uh, yellow, and the Russian Special Forces yellow is basically, uh, it is the same hue or tint or uh, whatever you want to call it, as baby poop. It is as close to the baby poop yellow as you're going to get. And it's Russian Special Forces yellow. Now, how about the jungle green? How about the jungle green? We For the for the green, we used the... And you said, man, I went to the Duracoat website, and they have 27 different shades of green. <laughs> well, I don't know if they have 27, but they have many. There's lots of green. There's not just green. There is green. There's actually, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jared, what's eight times seven? 56. 56. They have 56 shades of green. But the one that you're looking for, for which you are looking, uh, if you want to match it up, is the vortex green so we use the vortex green and i use the russian special forces yellow 
And I created, using Duracoat, a Rhodesian camouflage pattern for the ARMED. So for those of you that were curious, um, that is how you do it. You can go to Duracoat Firearm Finishes right now, and you can get the can in can technology. Uh, and you can do it yourself in your garage or your workshop or wherever you want to do it. I don't care. Uh, and if you want to do it like a pro, which you should, you should always want to do it like a pro, you can go to studentofthegun.com slash Duracoat. There's a hyperlink in the show notes. And that'll take you directly to Duracoat University, where you can learn how to be a Duracoat master. You will learn everything that you need to know to become a Duracoat master finisher and then you can set your set your little shop up and you can actually charge people imperial credits or uh, venmo credits or or bitcoin or whatever i don't care they can pay for it in silver and gold <laughs> so check those guys out at duracode firearm finishes.com all right oh uh, what did we talk about last week um the the, the the high point thing we talked about last week was something 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 dark side something something complete yes indeed yes indeed oh they had a Father's Day special where they had the 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 JCP forty and the JCP forty fives on sale so if that's something you're looking for don't forget they have the three hundred or the thirty super thanks for asking. <laughs> uh, oh thanks for asking all things considered we're doing quite well yes indeed so as far as the eat cannon is concerned there's no new news yet so just hold on hold on juicy.com if you want to see the new saving aunt Susie video uh it's about five minutes long and it's illustrative and it will help you so check out our channel at juxxi.com. That's juxxi.com. They're not reliant on Google or YouTube, and uh, they will not uh, they will not track you to the to the bicycle store or the pet food store and uh, and spam you with pet food commercials because they don't do that. There you go. All right, and. We probably we could do a whole entire Saving Aunt Susie thing, but we're not going to do that right now. You guys, go watch the video. Go watch the video. All right. It is time for me to be quiet and for Zach to, well, play some more music or something. Attention, new listeners. We produced a complimentary online training course called Seven Training Tips That Could Save Your Life. Get instant access by joining the Student Lounge for free at studentofthegun.com. Do you watch Student of the Gun TV, read the blog, and follow us on Facebook? If you answered no to any of these questions, you are wrong, but you can easily fix yourself. Go to studentofthegun.com to find everything SOTG. Oh man, I tell you what. Yeah, what I just discovered is if you type in seven training tips, do you know how many returns you're going to get? <laughs> a lot. Everybody has. The CPR has seven training tips. Uh, bodybuilding has seven training tips. First aid, seven training tips. And student of the gun, seven training tips that could save your life. That's right. Yes, indeed. Check it out. All right. Let us go, as we always do, uh, to Brownells Bullet Points, brought to you by Brownells. All right. Yes, indeed. I am at Brownells website right now, and on the homepage, there's a picture of someone shooting a G-lock. It looks to me like a like a 48 or a 43. I'm not sure which one it is, uh, but it has the original plastic factory sights. And if you have a G-lock with the original plastic factory sights, that's cute. 
That's interesting. That's nice for you. But what you should do is get your fanny over to nightfission.com. That's N-I-G-H-T, fission, F-I-S-I-O-N.com. When you do that, you can click on, it says uh, handgun sights, Glock, click, standard height, standard height, accurate. That's right, ACC, you are the number eight. That is where you go. You click there, and then you can get yourself some student of the gun accurate sights for the Glock 17, 19, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 31, 32, or the 42, the 43, the 43 X ray, or the 48. They will fit on there. So there you go. If you've got a 48, a 43, a 43 X, uh, we've got sites for you. There you go. So, but I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to talk about that specifically because, but I went to the Brownells website and there was. Like I said, picture of a Glock with uh, standard plastic factory sights on it. And we can do better. We can do better. Well, what do we talk about during Brownells bullet points every week? What is our what is our main feature? It's on hardware, right? Generally, it's on stuff, things, things that, you, that go in on. What does Brownells have? Everything you need to go in on or around a gun, right? And that includes ammunition. So this is going to launch me into my discussion of ammo wars. Yes, indeed. Da, 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 da. I was on the, uh, like I said, the AK corner uh, this last week with my buddy Marty and Joe Mo and Marco. And we were talking about, obviously, AKs. And we're talking about Romanian AKs. And the, the standard Romanian AK is chambered in 762 by 39 millimeter, which is a 30 caliber round. And if you talk to people in the firearms world, they'll tell you that um, that the 762 by 39 is ballistically very close to a 3030. Not the same. Don't write me letters telling me that it's not the exact same. I know it's not the exact same, but but ballistically it's very close. And uh, then we were talking about what the Russians did when the Russians decided to go with the 5.45 by 39 millimeter, because, you know, a lot of this is rumor and conjecture because it was all going on in the seventies and it wasn't like we had the internet and it wasn't like the Russians were talking to us. And even if they were talking to us, they were probably lying um, to us. So some people say that they, uh, the Russians were just doing the keeping up with the Joneses. They're like, oh, well, they're, the NATO guys are doing 5.56. Five, we have to do something that's the same. Uh, and also, depending on who you talk to, who you listen to, what you read, some people say that Mikhail Kalashnikov was 100% against the 5.45. Five. And then other people say, just calm down. By the, by the 70s, Mikhail was... An older dude, you know, he was born in he was he's he was a World War II soldier, so he wasn't by the 1970s he was he was up there. I mean, he wasn't super old, but he was up there. And a lot of people say he'd already done his work, and he had his he had his apartment in Moscow, and 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 they were taking care of him. So, did he really care? He was like, I hate this, and I don't want you to do it. I don't know. But if you talk to people who've been overseas in the big sandbox, um, they will tell you that the people who have been on the receiving end of the 5.45 by 39 don't think that it's a varmint squirrel cartridge. They call it the poison bullet. The 5.45 by 39 is a ferocious bullet which is one of the reasons why they decided to come up with some bull cr- by your government, your criminal government decided to come up with some bull crap excuse. Uh, and, and it, was, it was Obama. Yeah. Uh, they came up with this bull crap about, um, you know, it's illegal to have a pistol that has armor piercing bullets. And so you can't have that. No, the real reason that 7N6 
is not being imported anymore is because the criminals in Washington don't think that you, the peasants, should have good stuff. The whole made-up bullcrap 7N6 ban is just to deprive the American citizen soldier, which is what you are and it's what you should be and it's what your history is. If you are a grown man, citizen American, it is your duty, not a hobby, not if you feel like it. It's actually your civic duty to be a citizen soldier. Read your history. So, talking a lot about cartridges, and that led us, everything I just said, led us to a discussion about the 6-8 SPC and the Army's desire to buy new guns. But, before we do that, let's take a look at what's going on in Israel. I thought this was cool. I had missed this story. The story is actually a couple of years old. Uh, but it's significant because it shows, it kind of shows you, it's not quite two years old, but uh, kind of shows you what's going on out there. So, and, and we've actually, we've featured and reviewed the, the Tavor rifle uh, previously. Uh, I have one. So check this out. Did you, you have it open? It's the is IsraelHayom.com by Hanan Greenwood. You should turn your microphone on. It'd be easier for us to hear you. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I've been muted this whole time. I was just looking for the video on the Tavor that we did. Zach, if you could pull that from one of the video channels, that would be awesome. Drop it in the show notes so people could watch it. The parting shots only after a decade IDF retires Tavor rifle. And I believe that it was like 2017 or 2018 and the late 2010s. The uh the I, I do they call them commandos like are their special special forces version yeah um I believe that back then is when the commandos started using the M4 um but you can check me if I'm if you think that that's incorrect but this one's oh, talking dude. about the entire IDF what yeah you you know when the 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 outdoorhub dot com has a story from seven seventeen thirteen. 13. Jeez. Student student of the Gun TV presents the Israeli Tavor. Oh, that's okay. That's for, for that Tavor. Yeah. Yep. There we go. So it's been it's been t- almost 10 years. Jeez. Yeah, cuz I remember that was very sh- sh- like shortly after it came out, right? Yeah, it was, it was that was the year that it came out. Yeah. So anyway, for years the Israeli Tavor rifle was marketed as the rifle of the future, and many of the IDF's infantry fighters proudly carried it, enthusiastic about its convenience and futuristic look. However, yep. just ten years after its integration into the Israeli army, the IDF will soon begin transitioning the infantry brig- brigades that currently use the Tavor and Micro Tavor to the American M4, known as a flat top rifle. <laughs> one of the idf's infantry brigades is expected to receive the m4 rifle in the near future followed by the others the israeli made rifles will not be retired completely rather will be transferred to the army's reserve b- brigades all right so this is exactly what happened in the late 60s early 70s so if you guys know your uh, if you know your history you'll know that when israel became a country back in 48, a new country or whatever, like a reestablished country, whatever you want to call it. Um, they, pro- they were using World War II surplus guns, Enfields and Sterlings and, and pretty much anything they could get their hands on. But the vast majority of the guns that they were using were provided by uh, essentially England, by Great Britain, because Great Britain was kind of like their, their rabbi. Uh, <laughs> get that? Get it? Great Britain was functioning as their rabbi. Um, so they, they shipped over Connex boxes full of World War II surplus guns. Like I said, Enfields and Sterlings and, and you know, 
so on and so forth. Stand guns and Sterlings and you know, and they were they would basically they were just happy to have guns. They were using whatever they could get their hands on, right? But then when when once Israel has had established itself as a nation, they said, "Well, we need to have we need to build our own stuff, right?" Now they they actually had they licensed and built uh, FN FALs, right? They had the Israeli version of the FAL, the standard one, and then they had an Israeli version of the the squad automatic wipe weapon or the squad automatic rifle, where they did a heavy barreled. FN it had a heavy barrel and it had a bipod and so forth. And then IMI started spinning up their own guns. Obviously, you guys all know that that IMI and uh, Uzi Gal came up with this submachine gun, this this uh, third generation or maybe second generation submachine gun um, called the Uzi. Yep, very famous. So they started blasting folk over there. They started blasting the Hodge with the Uzis. And another gun that they came up with was the Galil, right? And they came up with the Galil, and the Galil was chambered in both 5.56 and 7.62 NATO. They had numerous versions. They had a sniper version, then they had a commando version, they, you know, they had the folding stock version, then they had the battle rifle version. And as we've discussed in previous um discussion as well in the real men wear shorts video the galil found its way to africa and then the south africans in 1980 licensed that and started producing their very own versions uh called the r4 right well the galil if you if you look at at the uh, at in the 80s you look at the late 70s 80s 90s if you looked at troopers in Israel, they weren't carrying Galils. They're carrying M16s. Like, well, why would Israel be carrying M16s when they have IMI, IWI? They, they have the, the capacity to, to produce their own guns, to build them. The Galil was a fantastic design. So why did they swap out Galils for M16s. Why are, why are all these dudes running around with M16s? I'll tell you why. Because the United States of America made a billion of them, right? Or millions of them. And then the United States of America decided, hey, we're going to switch from the M16A1 to the A2. What are we going to do with all these A1s? Let's sell them to Israel for 100 bucks a pop. <laughs> right? So if you're Israel, you say, and, and, and Israel has M4s, but Israel, if you, if you look, if you uh, you see them with the carrying handle guns, right? So they went from A ones, and I don't know if they ever really carried the A twos, but then they went to the the carrying handle M fours, right? And now, so if you're Israel and you and you say, all right, it's costing us five hundred shekels per unit to build Galils, but the Americans are going to give us ship they literally there is a ship sitting off the coast with connex bosses filled with m16s and they're going to charge us a hundred shekels per right i'm throwing in a lot of hebrew lingo right now um what would what would you do all right well we could either take we can buy five guns for the cost of building one or we can just say no we're going to keep building one well obviously they're going to do that and so the one the what you guys might not know bullpup rifles are generally kind of expensive to manufacture the famas the french famas bullpup atrocity that they just love to i don't know why um is like three thousand bucks a pop per unit uh, you know why they love it because it's in call of duty yeah it's in call of duty uh so if you if you look at what does it cost to build a brand new Tavor, you, per unit cost, what do they spend at eight thousand, twelve hundred bucks per unit cost? Right. Oh, I think it's at eight thousand. I was like, I yeah, don't think no, eight, so. Eight hundred, twelve hundred, you know, eight hundred thousand, twelve hundred bucks. Well, what is the U.S. Army doing? The U.S. Army just announced that it's going to buy a whole bunch of new Sig rifles. So what does that mean? 
That means that the U.S. Army now has Connex boxes filled with M4s. It's, it's economics. I had, I had some, a, a, an RIA commented that the reason that the Israelis went away from the FAL was because it was totally unreliable. And the M16 was far more reliable. For real? Mm. No. It was because, well, we could build our own or we could get these bargain basement smoking hot deals on M16s from America. Which one should we do? And it's the exact same thing. Right now, it is the exact same thing. They're like, well, America just gave us a smoking hot deal on M4s. So we could either get those or we can continue to spend lots of money and build our own. What are we going to do? Gee, I don't know. What are they going to (laughs) do? Which brings us to, and we've used this, uh, this story before, but it's, uh, it's from uh, April 2022. The Army announces two new rifles for close combat soldiers. Rawr, 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 rawr. The, uh, the XM5 rifle and the XM250 automatic rifle. And they're going to be chambered in the 6.8 SPC. So right now, U.S. Army Special Forces is using the Mark 262. You have a 77 grain bullet going about 3,000 feet per second. It does great things. The standard SPC-2 is a 115 grain bullet going around 25 to 2,600 feet per second, right? The 762 by 39 millimeter is a 30 caliber bullet averaging around 2,200 feet per second. Right now on planet Earth, the two most prevalent fighting rifle cartridges are 5.56 millimeter and 7.62 by 39 with 5.45 being close, but not quite there. And here we have the 6.8 SPC2. So my question to you is, if you're spending taxpayer money and you're going to do it responsibly, what's the better deal? Buying a cartridge that's already available in ready supply at about 30 cents a shot, or buying the 6.8 SPC2. Have you guys, do you guys know how much that ammunition costs. Let's go to, uh, is what is it? Ammo Seek. Let's go to AmmoSeek.com. Thank you, Ammo, Ammo Seek. You can uh, send us a check uh, for the for the promotion. Let's go to AmmoSeek.com and let us search for six eight SPC. All right, where is the search bar? There we go. Search by <laughs> caliber, rifle. All right, rifle, caliber. Doo, 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 doo. Where the heck is the 6.8 SPC? Should be right there in front of my face. Shouldn't be that hard to find. It's funny because it hasn't been that popular of a cartridge. I mean, it's been pretty popular, but not like everybody going to search for it. And now that this is happening, it's gonna the people are gonna be like, why are why are people searching for 6.8 SPC? Here we I go. All right, I found it at ammoseek.com. Start seeking now. All right, so the price, the best price, the best one is Salir and Below. It's the Salir and Below imported ammo at a buck 10 a shot. Then the uh, let's go let's look for American made stuff. American made Remington full metal jacket, 115 grain full metal jacket. Buck twenty five a shot. Uh, Hornady, here we go. Hornady's hundred grain uh, SPC around hundred grain, and this is the uh, probably an expanding bullet. One hundred thirty seven or, or one point three seven cents per shot. 
uh, Winchester, uh, the extreme polymer point, a buck forty-five a shot. So you get it. So the absolute cheapest one you're going to get, and that with foreign import ammo, is a buck ten a shot. The American-made Remington is a buck twenty-five a shot. Now I know. Don't write me letters saying, "Oh, the government gets a better deal than that because they buy in bulk." Yeah, I get that. But comparing apples to apples. There's no way that you can tell me that SPC ammo uh, is going to be comparable to 762 by 39. And you're like, hold on, Paul, just stop for a second. Are you saying that you're, are you suggesting that the American army would use a 762 by 39 millimeter? That's sacrilege. Well, what is the excuse? That they, why, why, what is the excuse that they're using to spend billions of dollars and millions of which are going to go into the pockets of generals and congressmen and senators via graft and corruption? What's the excuse? The 556 isn't large enough, it's not powerful enough. Okay, what did the 762 replace? Jared, what did the seven, or I'm sorry, the 545? The 545 millimeter, they're saying it's not large enough and it's not powerful enough. Um what? Didn't they didn't 50 years ago they told us it was a better choice because soldiers could carry more ammo per pound. They would have more shots per pound of weight and they could have higher capacity guns and blah, 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 blah. That's why we had to get away from the 7.62 NATO. And here we are 50 years later, and they're like, yeah, we've decided that after a 20-year war that the 5.56 is not powerful enough. So we need a new cartridge. We need to spend billions of dollars coming up with a new cartridge. Why don't they just go back to... 762 NATO. It's an established cartridge. There's lots of rifles that chamber it. And if that's too much, why don't they go for the 762 by 39? There's a hundred million rounds of that on planet Earth at 20 cents a shot. No, we can't do that. We have to come up with brand new guns and a brand new cartridge and spend billions of taxpayer dollars to give our soldiers new toys. Ballistically, so the, the 6.8 SPC is less powerful than the 7.62 NATO, and it's supposedly, and it, it probably is, more powerful than the 5.56 Mark 262. But it's a larger cartridge, so pound for pound, the average soldier is going to is going to have for the same amount, let's say five pounds of ammo. Let's say the, the five pounds of ammo in five five six is X, but five pounds of ammo in six eight is X minus. Right? You can do the you can math it out yourself. Pound for pound. They're going to have fewer shots per pound with the SBC. The whole reason they told us we had to go to 5.56 was because we needed to be able to give our troops more shots per pound of ammo carried. So we did. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I don't hate the SPC cartridge. It's a great hog cartridge. It's fantastic for killing hogs. You can kill hogs, you can kill medium-sized game like deer and so forth. But do we need, at this point in time, when we are $31 trillion in debt, do we really need to be spending billions of dollars on a brand-new ammo system and brand-new guns? Why don't we put that money into training? Jared, do, have we talked about uh, on this show about how the army is having a hard time recruiting and filling their ranks? Yes, we have. Have we talked on this show about how the army, about the new recruits in the army are so uncoordinated and 
physically weak that they can't pass the grenade throwing qualification in boot camp in basic infantry training. So what do they do? They remove the standard. They're like, well, the, the, yeah, our recruits can't throw a grenade uh, accurately or far enough to pass the. So what we'll do is we'll re remove the standard. Troops are too stupid to get basic land nav. So they just eliminated it. What? Maybe instead of spending billions of dollars on new toys, we could invest in training and making the troops better. Nah, can't do that. Don't need to do that. No, we'll, we're just going to spend a billion dollars. We're going to spend billions of dollars and hand out rainbow flags. That's what we're going to do. Okay, cool. All right, moving on. Student of the Gun Homeroom brought to you by Student of the Gun University. Go to SOTGU.com and sign up today. All right, uh, I'm going to guess most of you didn't see this because it happened over the weekend, and it does not fit the narrative. So the U.S. media is going to, U.S. media outlets will cover this one time and then never again. They will cover it one time and then they will never cover it again because this does not help their agenda. Because the agenda is the more gun control, the better. And people shouldn't have guns. And guns are bad. And we need to put up signs at our schools and policy statements. And the, the Gun Free Schools Act of 1995 has kept American schools safe and secure for 25, 30 years. Has it? Or has it been an abject and complete failure? The Gun Free Schools Act has done what does liberalism always generate, Jared and or Zach? The opposite of its stated intent. intent. The exact opposite of its stated intent. If you want to be a smart human, go back pre-1995, pre-1990, because the first Gun Free Schools Act was in 1990, and then Clinton and his Congress reinforced and, and expanded it in 1995 and they went out and boy they did a media campaign and they were so proud of themselves oh american schools are going to be safer than they ever have been before because we were the gun free schools act it's a felony to have a gun anywhere near a school you can't talk about a gun in a school you can't draw a picture of a if your kid draws a picture of a gun we will drag them out and call the sheriff's department do you remember the the, the, uh, the atrocities, the gun-free school atrocities that were going on, the, the first grader who came to school with a little tiny keychain-sized gun that he got out of a, a gumball machine, and they made the kid sit in the principal's office and piss his pants while oh, they yeah. interrogated him. The kid who made the, the finger gun and was pulled out of class and, and sent to see the counselor and, and interrogated for three hours before the parents were contacted. Yeah, that's, that's what you get. So we got a story from June 18th, which you probably didn't hear about it because it was over the weekend, and this doesn't support the anti-gun disarmament agenda, but it happened, and it happened in the world, and it happened at a Christian school where they were in the middle of singing hymns when this happened. Jared. You've gone to school attack. What we know so far, this is from Al Jazeera. Yes. A super trustworthy news source. Yeah. Under reels from its deadliest attack in more than 10 years after a rebel group killed 41 civilians, mostly students. Uganda forces are hunting for rebels accused of killing at least 41 civilians, mostly students, in the worst attack in the country in more than a decade. Authorities have blamed Friday's attack in Mpondwe town near the border of the Democratic Republic of Kondo, Congo, DOC, DRC. They blamed it on the Allied Democratic Forces, or the ADF. 
different from the IDF. Yeah. The ADF is a force, a rebel group that has pledged allegiance to ISIL or ISIS slash ISIS. They're jihadists. Okay. They are jihadists. And the school I don't see anywhere was a in, Christian school. I don't see that in this article. Where did you ah, find that info? Here is the sick thing about this. Uh, this. So I looked at a couple different ones. Depending on where you go, depending on where you go, the media is spinning it differently. For instance, for instance, uh, several American news outlets have called it. Uh, they they call them rebel forces or opposition forces. Opposite. Well, what opposite? What are they opposed to? They're jihadists, and uh, they ran into their, according to witnesses from the BBC.com, ran into the school screaming, "Aloha snack bar." Yes, indeed. You see, I had I went through three or four different sources because depending, you want to know whether or not this book is real. The Rape of the Mind by Yus Merlu about conditioning and about sci psychological operations. Look at the treatment of this story. So rebels who are who have pledged allegiance to ISIS, a group that Al Qaeda said, "Wow, those guys are kind of extreme." Al Qaeda was talking about ISIS, and they're like, mm, "They might go a little too far." Oh. Uh, you, depending on the source, they whitewash it to the point where oh, it's it's uh, uh, rebel forces, mm, opposition forces. Mm, okay. Some of the stories say that they interrupted the singing of hymns as they attacked. Oh, rebel attack. NBC rebel attack kills dozens in a school. Hmm. 41 killed as rebels attack. You see, in the, the media parlance, rebel is a good thing. Now, if you go to the BBC, it says Uganda rebels linked to ISIS. Ah, there you go. AP, rebel attack a school near the Congo. You have to dig really deep. It was a Christian school, and that is why the ISIS rebels attacked it. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are a rebel alliance, right? You're a rebel alliance, and you want to overturn the criminal government of Uganda. You think, you say, your, your PR is that the government of Uganda is illegitimate and is tyrannical and needs to be brought down. And you are the solution. You are the rebel alliance, right? So if you really, if your stated goal really for real is to destabilize the illegitimate, tyrannical government of Uganda, what would your main target be? The actual government? Wouldn't you think, Jared? So you remember during the American Revolution when the American patriots wanted their, they wanted independence from England, what they did was they went into schools and killed all the kids in the schools, and that showed them. That'll show King George. That'll show King George. We're going to go into the school and kill all these kids. That'll, that'll show him. This is when you say, no, are you a psycho? That's obviously not what happened. Yeah, because that's not how you undergo governmental change. You don't go through, you don't experience governmental change by killing kids in schools. Unless you're affiliated with ISIS, unless you're a jihadist and you hate infidels, which are Christians. And you go into a school and kill them. 
Why is this in the student of the gun homeroom? What is the student of the gun homeroom all about? Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, Jared, what's it all about? Uh, being dangerous on demand. Being dangerous on demand. We have been, I've been sounding this bell for how long have I been sounding the bell that no one is coming. It is up to you. We talked about the 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 attack at the 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 mall in that was it Northgate, Westgate, something Kingsgate, whatever in in Kenya, when only the people who were on the inside of the building had any opportunity to affect the outcome. Malls, that kid Elijah, Elijah uh, Dickin, inside of the mall right he was there when it started the uh jack what's gentleman jack's last name inside of the church skinned out his roscoe bam three seconds dead bad guy on the ground compare that to everyone inside of the building is disarmed we have to wait for the popo to show up whether it's a church, whether it's a school, whether it's a mall. If everyone inside the building is disarmed except the killers, you're going to have a high body count. When people inside of the building are armed, you will have a low body count. It's not hyperbole. It's not politics. It's facts. It's reality. Disarming Americans inside of schools doesn't keep them safe from psychos disarming americans anywhere whether it's a mall or a church or a school or whatever doesn't keep them safe it it actually does the exact opposite what does liberalism always generate the exact opposite of its stated intent undeniable truth number 37 or 24 i can't remember which one it was from dear, dearly departed Rush Limbaugh. And every day, this is proved out. When you disarm the teachers, when you make it a gun-free zone, then only the bad people have guns. You guarantee a high body count. I've been working on a book. It's called The Knights of St. Nicholas, and it's all about how to protect and defend Christian schools. And the answer is not the police. Sorry. If you're a cop and it offends you, then you're not a good cop. Because if you're a cop, you would say, yeah, I, can't, I know that I can't be everywhere all the time, and it's up to people to defend themselves. If you're a good cop, like the former chief of police in Detroit, you would say to the people, look, my guys can't be everywhere all the time. You need to buy guns, get training, and defend yourselves. That's a good cop. Okay, that is a good cop. The former sheriff of Milwaukee County, that's a good cop. What's uh, the Detroit, James, what's, what's his last name? James chief i i I want to give him credit the one who said hey you need to buy guns you need to get training you need to defend yourselves craig james craig yes so that the new the new chief who replaced him is, is also james so there's james apparently you're you have to your first name has to be james to be the chief of police of uh of Detroit, <laughs> you can you you want to be a chief? You better change your first name to James because that's that's all we pick. But uh, so James Craig was the chief of police, and now James White is the chief of police. But James Craig said to the people of Detroit, "My cops can't be everywhere all the time. You need to buy guns, get training, defend yourselves." When people say the answer is 911, the answer is more SROs. The answer is no. The answer is responsible adult humans getting training, carrying guns, being prepared to defend innocent lives. Jared, what did Jack McGeorge teach me 
teach us, my peers, about terrorism and the behavior of terrorists? What are they? Imitative or innovative? Oh, that's right. Imitative. Imitative. Terrorists are imitative, not innovative, which means this. As long as an attack, as, the, as long as their strategy, their tactic, their attack keeps working, they will keep doing that. They will keep doing that thing until it no longer works or it is proven to no longer works or until it fails several times. And then once it has failed or once the, the enemy, their enemy, once the terrorist enemy, the good guys, we call the good guys, once they figure out how to stop that, they shift tactics. When's the last time an airplane was hijacked in America? 20 years ago, right? Yet yeah, we're still, they, they're, they, that tactic is over. They've moved on. But we're still behaving as if they're trying to hijack aircrafts every single day, right? Rather than focus on the real problem, which is lone individual psychos walking into gun-free zones and committing mass murder, we are harassing, we're treating airline passengers like criminals. So we're still, the government is still focused on, on hijackings and treating airline passengers as potential criminals and terrorists. Meanwhile, the terrorists have shifted tactics. Now they're like, oh, well, yeah, well, we had these gun-free zones, which were airports and aircraft and stuff, and those were good targets. Those aren't good targets anymore. So we have other gun-free zones, churches, schools, you know, Democrat-run cities. We'll go to those so we can get high body counts. And we're still behaving as if we can stop bad people with signs plastic signs and policy statements and oh we'll make sure all the doors are locked until they're not all the doors will always be locked all the time how is that possible there are 387 522 804 people in this building and they have to be able to come and go all all day long how are you going to ensure that it's locked up like a prison you can't it's a fallacy Jared, you you went to West Holmes High School, right? I went to West Holmes High School. I went to a different high school, a different building. But you remember the junior high? Yeah. Okay. Remember the doors that led into it? The front doors? Uh, yeah. What were they made out of? Glass. Glass. So you lock them, so people a, a bad a psycho with a gun can't get through because it's locked. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Ladies and gentlemen, attacks are going to keep happening, and they're going to keep happening at Christian schools because evil humans have decided that Christians are bad and work, and they need to be killed. And if you are a Christian or in charge of a Christian school or work at a Christian school, you need to understand that no one is coming. They will come eventually. After five, six, 10, 12 people are dead on the ground, they'll eventually come. But understand this here is the reality. Only the people who are present the moment the attack happens will have any hope of positively affecting the outcome. That's reality. We can, you can talk about hyperbole or it's, it's terrible that people have guns. It's terrible. No one should be allowed. Yeah, no one should be allowed to commit murder or rape or fraud or larceny or robbery. No one should be allowed to do that. And that's a wonderful kumbaya. Let's all hold hands and sing kumbaya and all the rapists and murderers in the world will just go away. Right? Is that how that works? It's not how that works. Terrorists, people who go into schools and murder children are terrorists. They are imitative, not innovative. I learned that 30 plus years ago. 
And as long as it keeps working, they will keep doing it. And until we figure out a way to harden our schools to make that not happen anymore, and you harden them by putting responsible, trained adults with guns in them, so that when Johnny Psycho, when Johnny Jihad, when Johnny Trans Weirdo walks in with a rifle, the person at the front desk or in the hallway or the gym teacher can say, not today, and they can make them stop immediately. Just thought I would bring that up to you. I'm, I can almost guarantee you that 90% of my audience did not see this story because it doesn't fit the gun control narrative. It doesn't fit the Muslims are the, are the religion of peace and brotherhood narrative. So we're just going to we'll report it once, and then we'll move on. All right. Last but certainly not least, see, I told you so. So three weeks ago, we played the entire 20-minute briefing from Dr. David Martin, who went in front of the, uh, the EU, was it uh, Commission, Council, Parliament, or whatever, the Parliament of the European Union, and delivered a shot for shot. You know what we need to do, Jared? Can you drop that link that you had in the, in the Slack? that actually has the slides in, yeah. into today's show notes. Yeah. So yeah. Dr. David Martin explained, he said, look, this is reality. The SARS, the, the, what is it, SARS CV-19, whatever, was discovered in 1965. They started working on it, modifying it, and altering it in 1967. In 1990... Pfizer tried to come up with a, quote, spike protein MRA vaccine to stop SARS-CV-19. And they knew, found out, they discovered in 1990 that there wasn't, that it wouldn't work because SARS-CV-19 was a man made altered they they started out with a common cold virus and they modified it and they gain of functioned it and they created a man-made virus sars cv19 did not come accidentally from undercooked bat soup in a wet market in wuhan it was actually developed the current strain was developed the one that broke out of the wuhan institute of virology in 2020 was developed at the University of Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, under the direct auspices and watchful eye of the CDC. It was sent from there to Wuhan, to the WIV, where it escaped accidentally into the populace. All of this is demonstrable. All of this is trackable. And here we are today, and we have a story about the CDC. The CDC is a criminal organization. If you don't understand that by now, I don't know what to say to you. The CDC just had a get-together. And at their get together, at their, their 2023 annual epidemic intelligence conference, they identified 181 people who tested positive for COVID 19. Of the 181 people identified as testing positive, 100% of them had taken the quote unquote vaccine. 100%. And so the way the, CD, the CDC is a criminal political organization, the way they spun it was, well, yeah, maybe they contracted it and they tested positive, but none of them had to be hospitalized. hospitalized. So it's, that just proves that the vaccine works. 
Hey, liars, criminal liars at the CDC. That's not how a vaccination works. A vaccination is something you take to prevent. Can you imagine if people got smallpox or polio after taking the polio vaccine? So people took the polio vaccine and then they still got polio. And then the vaccine makers like, well, yeah, but you got the not as bad kind of polio. What? Are you insane? No, until the last 10 years, like till the last five years, maybe three. What would any, if you said to a, 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 an intelligent adult human, what does a vaccine do? Well, it's, it's a shot. It inoculates you against that disease. Smallpox, measles, mumps, rubella, polio. It inoculates you against it. It's preemptive. We give you a shot. Your body develops a defense mechanism. Therefore, that, what, that, and what that does is if you're exposed to it, you don't get it. You see, that's what the f- polio, oops, sorry, polio vaccine did. You give people an inoculation, then they don't get polio. That's the purpose. Polio has been eradicated in the United States unless you're Bill and Linda Gates and you fund a polio vaccination over in, I think it was the Philippines. It was, it was in Asia. Southeast Asia, and then you you give little kids all these shots, and they all develop polio. I feel like I'm living in crazy, like I'm taking crazy pills. If you have not read this book, The Rape of the Mind by Eust Mirlu, go go to Amazon and buy this mother loving book. Do it. Why? Why would I do that, Paul? Why would I do that? I don't want to read that. Because this book, written in 1958, explains everything that has happened in the last three to five years. Actually, going back farther than that. But you would say, I don't understand. I think that everyone in government was just doing the best they could with the information that they had. And, and it was a crisis for everyone. And you can't blame people. The F you can't. The CDC developed, they paid through uh, third-party intermediaries, through Fauci, for the, what is it, what, what is it called? What, what, did, what did Fauci pay Wuhan to do? What's the phraseology? I'm giving you boys a chance to participate. Uh, replicate. No, no. Are you talking about gain of function? Gain of function. Thank you very much. Here. They paid gain of function means we're going to take a virus. We're going to modify it. We're going to make it more infectious. What? Didn't the United States going all the way back to World War II and World War I sign treaties saying that that was a crime against humanity and we would never do that. Biological warfare is a crime against humanity. It is a weapon of mass destruction. And your government, the criminal government of the United States of America did exactly that. Forget about the, oh, I don't believe that anyone would ever release it on purpose. I just don't believe it. Okay, you don't believe it. Do you believe the fact that this University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, that they actually had 
they used government, United States government grant money, which is your taxes, to gain a function, develop a biological weapon. How is that okay? How is it okay that the government used, gave grant money to doctors, scientists, to gain a function and make a virus more lethal and more contagious? How is that okay? Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm a mama, I'm a nana, mama. So after all of this information is now public, it's no longer, it's no longer conspiracy theory. Of course, I've known that this was true for three years. I knew it was a lie three years ago. I've said from the very beginning, this is a lie. So the CDC, what was it? Two weeks ago. This this came out their their little their little get together. June first. Rather than it, admit the, the truth, story was produced. Okay. Rather than admit the truth, they doubled down, and in the story, it they say we still think that every American six months and older should get the shot. What? Are you insane? All I can, this is criminal behavior, and we were right this whole time. You, me, everybody in the audience who refused to become a lab rat for their psychotic medical experiment, an experiment they knew would fail. Going back to 1990, they knew that MNRA spike protein shots would not stop transmission, reception, or they wouldn't stop it. They knew it. And yet they did it anyway. They knew that these shots wouldn't stop you from getting it. They knew these shots wouldn't stop you from transmitting it, and yet they pushed it on you anyway, and they lied. The question you need to ask yourself as an intelligent human is, why? If they knew that the shots would not stop you from getting sick, if they knew the shots would not stop you from transmitting it, why do it? Why do it? What's the other motive? Who benefits? All right. This week on Student of the Gun University podcast, it is a short form, easy to digest, single topic. And you can find it at Student of the Gun University uh, on iTunes, on uh, Spotify, on iHeartRadio. And we're talking about time investment. What are you investing your time in and how can we invest our time properly and wisely? All right, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, thank you very much for joining us today. I truly appreciate you being out there. I appreciate you sharing this with other people. Let them know. Let them know. All right. Well, cat in the hat, and that be that, Buster Rhyme, and it is time, it is time for me to say the following. Remember, you're a beginner once. You're a student for life. Thanks for staying until the end. Want to water the seeds of freedom we planted together today? Head over to wherever you listen to us and leave a like, rating, or review. It makes a big difference. Have a show topic submission? We would love to hear it. Submit it to info at studentofthegun.com. A delightful human will get back to you faster than you can finish a one-box workout. Remember to check studentofthegun.com often for new and free content, giveaways, and more. Watch, listen, read, shop, and connect at studentofthegun.com. And remember, you are a beginner once, a student for life.